I do have a, a word from God. I want to jump right in. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, I, I do want to talk to, to 267 people that made a choice to go public with their faith in baptisms last week. What an amazing journey. I want to I want to talk to those who've been coming to the journey since the beginning or those who are just in the beginning of the journey at journey. Uh, I, I want to talk to those who've been following Christ for a long time or following Christ for a short amount of time. I want to talk to those who feels like they should be here in church and maybe some of you feel like you are disqualified because of what happened last night. You don't belong here. Come on, somebody. I want to, I want to talk to... A, a variety of people and it remind you of this one thing you are called you're called and, and, and there's something unique about a calling uh, that we all get to have is that, that, that God's call on our lives is so unique and so personable and is so you and I want to remind you of that. I know when life gets busy and demands of life gets busy, sometimes we can forget that we are called by God. There's something special by, about being called. Like God has called us by name. Like he knows our personality. He knows our past mistakes. He knows our future potential. And he calls you by name. That, that's something special if you think about it for a while. That you're called. You know, one of, one of the most unique and maybe popular callings that we see in the Old Testament is a calling of King David. You see, Israel had chose a king, Saul. And Saul had disobeyed God and and God says, I'm going to choose for myself a king. You see, Saul was a people's king, but David is God's choice as the king. And the Bible says that in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, where, where, where Samuel comes on a scene, and he's looking for the next king, and he brings in the kids of this guy named Jesse into a house, and he looks at the oldest child of Jesse, and he was tall, and he had all the outward appearances of a king. But, but then God says those famous words that many of us know. He says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God, he looks at your heart. So the Bible says that, that Samuel looks at all the sons of Jesse and he couldn't find the one that God wanted to anoint the king. And so Samuel finally says to Jesse, hey, do you have any more kids? And Jesse says, yes, I have another kid. He's actually in the, the fields taking care of the sheep right now. Bring him in. He comes in. And that's the person that God uses and says, I want to anoint this person and call this person to be the, the next king of Israel. And there's a story of of David's anointing and the Bible says that the prophet takes a, a, a horn of oil and he pours it on the head of David as a sign of his calling into a new king. Now I love this idea that, that David was called and that you and I are called. But if you go along and keep reading the story you recognize that the next chapter David is facing a giant. Like, don't you wish that before you said yes to the call of God on your life, that God would give you like the fine print of a calling, that every calling is associated with the giant? I'm actually glad that he didn't tell me that when I said yes to the calling of being a pastor or a leader, that all the drama I was going to be dealing with, I'm glad he didn't tell me because he would have told me, I would have said, absolutely no, God, I'm good. You know, it's like the fine print of calling. You know, like a, a, few, a few weeks ago, I had a young adult come to me and says that he knows I travel a lot. And he says, Pastor, uh, uh, Delta has this new MX card. And if you get the, uh, the credit card and you spend $1,000, you can get 100,000 miles. I said, did you read the fine print? I said, go back and read the fine print. Come back to me. Then he comes back a few weeks later. He's like, nah, pastor, that thing's 30% interest. Absolutely no. 
right? Like, I think that many of us, if we come to environments like this that's so inspiring, we come to church and the music's amazing, the production is amazing, and the hosts are amazing, the kids ministry are amazing, and when we come to environments like this, it's easy to say yes to a call, but I just want to remind you of the fine print of calling. It comes with giants. And I'm not sure what giants that you may be facing in your life, and maybe it's a giant of mental health or anxiety, or the giant of relational conflict, or the giant or of financial conflict, or the giant of loneliness. I'm not sure what giant that God's going to cause you to battle to fulfill your call, but I just want to let everybody know that we all got a giant to face because we're called. You know, by the way, when you study the narrative of the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament, the majority of it, especially the first and second Samuel, they're historical documents. These were documents that the people of God, the Jewish people, were used to learn the history of the people of God. They're historical. The documents. And all throughout the history of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you see God has riddled the Old Testament with all type of giants. By the way, Goliath is not the first giant that we've come and we meet in the Old Testament. In fact, there's giants in the book of Genesis. There are giants that we call the Nephilim. There are giants in Numbers where the people of God went out to spy out the land. And they saw giants and they said, we feel like grasshoppers. There were giants among the Amorites. There were giants among the land. And it's almost like God wanted you and I to read the historical documents to get used to giants so that when we have to face ours, we, won't, we will recognize that if God delivered them from giants, then certainly our God can deliver us from our giants. See, the reason why we study history is so that we can recognize patterns. We can see consequences of mistakes. We can see certain things that happen. And so when we study the history of the, the people of God, we will see that every time that God's people face a giant, he came through with his power to help them overcome a giant in their lives. And I want to encourage you all this, that every time that you face a large battle, something in your life that may appear to be like a giant, can I encourage you today that God's pattern is really clear. He comes alongside of his people and allow us to slay every giant that's keeping us from the call that God has on our lives today. That's the God that you serve. But I want to really talk about like the battles before the battle that David had to, to fight. I want to kind of hang out in this chapter of seven, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I really believe this, that there is a tax on our calling. Uh, there, there, there are attacks that the enemy has on our calling before we even get to our big giant fight. I really believe that the first attack that we see here in this text that we're going to see is that God always attacks your assignment. He always attacks your assignment. Let's pick it up in this text today. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Starting in, verse, starting in verse 17, it says this, Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and take these loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to their camp. It says, And take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit and see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. And they are with Saul and all the men of Israel in a valley of Eli fighting against the Philistines. Verse 20 says this, So early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and set out as Jesse directed him. Now, this ain't like a, a normal passage of scripture, like, okay, David is listening to his father uh, to go be an errand boy, to be a shepherd boy. But I just want to let you know what happened in the chapter before. David was anointed king. And the next time we see David, he's an errand boy. What do you do when God's dream on your life does not match with your current assignment? What do you do with the calling that God has given you does not match with your current reality in your life? 
Like, how do you wrestle with the particular job or season you find yourself in, and it, it, it seems and appears to be so far from the dreams that God put on your heart? And here we find ourselves in a particular place where David was anointed king and yet has an assignment as an errand boy. Now, I love this David God, and we've preached so many sermons off this particular narrative, and we love David, and David is so amazing, and we can learn how he was a shepherd boy, and if you will be faithful in your shepherd boy, God will elevate you. But there's one thing for him to be a shepherd boy before he was anointed king. It's a whole nother level of dysfunction when you're a shepherd boy after you were anointed king. You see, what happens is his father asks him, hey, would you just like, you'll be an errand boy and go give him a report of your brothers and deliver this food. And I don't know about you, but I would have had a conversation with my dad. Like, hey, dad, like I know like a couple nights ago I was your errand shepherd boy, but yesterday's price ain't today's price. Your boy a king now, come on. I don't know about y'all, like, hey, like, like, you know, like, I, I wonder what Jesse was thinking. He saw his son be anointed king of Israel, and yet he's still having him do errand boy duties. If I was David, I would have told my parents, absolutely not. Your boy's a king now. In fact, my brother should be delivering and checking in on me. I couldn't do that because my parents would have slapped the black off me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I don't care who anoints you, king. <laughs> so this guy, David, he, the Bible says in the text in verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flock and he took care, he, he, he put the, the flock in care of a shepherd and he did exactly as his father asked him to do. And I just want to encourage someone out there today that maybe you feel like you're far behind. You feel like you've missed the boat. You feel like you are so far from your dreams and the calling that God placed on your life. You feel like you made too many mistakes. And you feel like you're in a particular assignment of your life that seems so far from your dreams. But I come to let you know that the God of the universe it says to you that you are right on schedule. You are exactly where God has you to be. Because the current assignment that he has on your life is about to take you to your purpose. So there's something about that we all have, and we all have what I call a general purpose. And that's our general assignment. Why are we here? Why did God create us? Why do we do this thing called life? I believe that our general purpose is to bring glory to God. No matter who you are here today, once you said yes to the, the God as, and become the God of, and become the redeem of the Lord, you, our purpose is to make God look good. That's what we do. No matter who you are, no matter what your giftings is, no matter what your job is, no matter if you are young or old, no matter what color of skin, what background you are, our job is to make God look good, to bring glory to God today. That's why you're here, by the way. I just, I just want to let you know that. In fact, when we get to heaven, all we're going to do is bring glory to God and sing holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. Our lives is to make God that created you look really good. So that's our general assignment. But then we all have like what I call unique assignments. And that's what I call calling. Our calling is our unique assignment and so the way that I make God look good is that God allows me to use my words as a communicator of God's word so that he can be look good and he can have all the glory and so my calling is that I am a communicator of the gospel but my current assignment is that I'm a pastor I wasn't always a pastor and praise God I won't always be a pastor thank God dealing with all this drama I said it to say is this, is that like our, our assignment changes, but it's building to our calling, which is fulfilling our purpose. And sometimes we can feel discouraged when the, the assignment doesn't match the calling. But I want to tell you and encourage you that God is using the assignment 
to prepare you for the calling, which is going to prepare you for your purpose. So, like, I remember my first job. Let me tell you, just my first job I ever had, I was a bag boy in Miami, Florida at Winn-Dixie. Come on, somebody, y'all. Come on, y'all don't know nothing about no Winn-Dixie, y'all. You ain't saved unless you went to got some crab legs at Winn-Dixie, y'all. So I was a bag boy, and this is way back in the days when the bag boys used to walk the people outside the, the, the store. You remember those days? And they would load the car up, and we would pray and hope to God that we'd get a 50-cent tip or a dollar tip. Come on, somebody. And we were so excited for this particular job. And it was at Winn-Dixie, I learned the value of going, of going the extra mile. Living in South Florida, my next job, I cut grass. I was cut grass in the hot sun. And there I learned the value of proper planning and hydrating myself, even in the hot sun. And then when I was later on in high school, I got a job as a server working at Applebee's. Come on, somebody. Y'all remember when Applebee's used to be good, y'all? Come on. Y you remember like, like Applebee's and Red Lobster? It was like a place to go, and now we look over that. And so... Like, I remember, like, the Cowboy Burger. And I mean, I, just, I was all about Applebee's. But there I learned customer service. I learned how to take care of people and take care of their needs and their desires. And then I went on to college, and I got a job as a stock boy for Publix, everybody. Uh, so at nighttime, I would, I would cut the boxes open. I would load the shelves. And there I learned about proper inventory. Then my next job is that I, once I graduated college, I got a job at an urban ministry in downtown Lakeland, Florida. And there I learned how to take care of the least of these. We were serving prostitutes and drug dealers and those who come from really tough backgrounds. I learned there how to serve people that can't serve you back. And then I became a child abuse investigator. Yes, I work for DCF. Hopefully none of y'all know about DCF. And there I learned how the home of the American home is broken and the crisis of fatherlessness in our country. And then I got a job at being a youth pastor. And then I got a job being a campus pastor. And then I got another job being an associate pastor. And then right before we started our church a few years ago, I was selling mattresses. Yes, mattresses on the side of the road. Come on, somebody. I was teaching people the value of rest, not knowing how God was going to allow me to teach everybody the value that, of our God that brings rest to your weary soul. Here's what I'm trying to say. Every job and assignment I had, God was preparing me for the calling that I'm walking in right now. And whatever assignment you have right now, God is preparing you for the calling that you can't see yet so that you can fulfill the purpose that God has uniquely on your life today. And what the enemy wants to do is to convince you that your assignment is not where you should be. And I want to encourage you today that, yes, I know that David was anointed to be a king, but it seems like in verse 20, he gladly got up early in the morning and he said, you know what? I may have been anointed king, but I am still not too big to be an errand boy because here's what I recognize. If you are too big to serve, then you are too small to lead. And here's what we learn here in this text is that David says, I'm going to be an errand boy. I'm not sure where you are. I'm not sure what particular assignment that you have right now. And maybe it's the assignment of being a single mom, the assignment of being a stay-at-home mom, the assignment of working at a job that you don't feel like you should be at, the assignment that ever that God has you in right now, it is, I promise you, preparing you for your next calling that you are about to walk in. You are not behind. You're right on schedule and I know those voices that speak into your mind the voices that you're too late the voices that that speaks to who you are and which goes to my next point the next attack is not only on your assignment the next attack is on your adequacy that's what he does so he wants to he, he wants to attack you, your assignment. And here's how we fight back when, when he attacks our assignment. We just 
everything that was in front of us, we do with, the art, with excellence and with joy. We give everything that we have to God. Says, God, whatever assignment that you have in front of me, I'm going to maximize it to my best of my ability. But then the enemy want to come and attack your adequacy. Here's what the text says. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he was burned with anger and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness with? So this is David's older brother, by the way, who was there at the anointing of David. He saw David be king. And he says to David, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You don't belong in this battle. And I believe that David's older brother is the voice of the enemy that speaks to our soul that attacks our adequacy. And you know how he attacks it? By giving you inadequacy. So, by the way, whenever God calls you, you know who picks up the phone? Inadequacy. Just ask Moses. When God called Moses, hey Moses, I need to go save my people. God, I can't talk. Hey, Sarah, Abraham, I want you to have a child to start a great nation. God, we're too old. Hey, Jeremiah, won't you be the voice to my people? God, I'm but a youth. Hey, Gideon, why don't you go and use your army to go attack an enemy of God's people? But God, my army is too small. Can I tell you today that every time God calls his people throughout the scriptures, we see that they are attacked by inadequacy. See, I believe that pride and arrogance has killed a lot of callings, but equally so, I believe that inadequacy has killed just as much, as much of callings as arrogance. Here's why, because the enemy, enemy wants you to believe that you don't belong. And that's exactly what the voice of the enemy was speaking to David's mind. What are you doing here? Go back and be a shepherd boy. And remember, this is David's own brothers who saw the anointing. And David wanted those who were close to him, he wanted those to see him the most. They saw him the least. I'm not sure what voices are speaking to your mind that makes you feel like you're inadequate for the call of God that's on your life. I want to remind you that the enemy, if he can't change how you view God, he'll change how you view you. So this is exactly what David was wrestling with. Because here's this statement I want to say to you by Tony Evans. And he says this, how far we go and how much we grow is not just determined to what God thinks about us. It's also determined about how you think about you. And if the enemy has one job, it's to change how you view you. You see, all throughout the scriptures, we see those who say yes to Jesus. Like our, the adjectives that God uses to describe his people have been so interesting. We've been described as peculiar people, as the salt of the world, as the light of the world, as a city on the hill, pilgrims, the, 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 the exceptions, the elected, the selected. We've been described as the head and not the tail. We have been described as a royal priesthood. We have been described as the chosen. We have been described as the sons and daughters of God. We see this all throughout scriptures of what God calls you. And sometimes we got to believe not only what God calls us to be, but we got to believe that for ourselves. And what the enemy wants to do is to make you believe that all those adjectives that God used to describe you is not so. What are you doing here, shepherd boy? <laughs> you saw what you did last night. You, you, you really know who you really are. Because here's what happens. Whenever you are walking calling, inadequacy will come calling and picking up. Our, so a few years ago, right before we launched our church um, in Richmond, Virginia, now we're reaching tons of people. It's amazing what God is doing there in our church. Uh, right, six months prior to us launching our church, my wife was diagnosed with bipolar. 
And I thought that, oh my goodness, I didn't really know much about mental illness. And so I was like, man, like, I don't know how God's going to like use our, like our family. It's a lot of pressure of being a pastor, especially the vision that we had to be a large church and reaching thousands of people. And like, I'm like, what are we going to do? What are people going to say? How are they going to respond when we tell them? Do we keep it quiet? Do we, do we not say anything? Like, we just was like, man, inadequacy was hitting us all the time. And I, never, I didn't realize that my wife's diagnosis was going to be the very thing that God was going to use for us to reach a city of people that was suffering with mental illness. And I'm going to let you know today that the voice of the enemy will speak to your adequacy and feed you with inadequacy. And here's how he do it. He tells you the truth, but not the whole truth. That's how the enemy does. <laughs> like, so yes, David's older brothers are right. Yes, you're all right, Elab. Of course, David didn't belong there. Of course, he should have been taking care of the sheep. Of course, that he wasn't prepared for battle. Of course, he wasn't trained as a warrior. See, what the enemy does is that the enemy tells you the truth about your life, but not the whole truth. He only tells you half the truth. He don't tell you the part that God comes in and be strong where we're weak. He don't tell you that part. He'll tell you that part that how God's going to use the past and use your mistakes of the past and use it as fuel to move your calling for it. He'll tell you that part. He'll tell you that part that he's going to come and heal all the trauma and the experiences of your past. He'll tell you that part. Here's why. Because the enemy will only tell you half the truth, not the whole truth. And the whole truth is this, that our God is in covenant with us. He promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. He promised to always be with us. That's the whole truth. The whole truth is that our God is a healing God, that our God is a faithful God, that our God is a redeeming God. That's the whole truth today. I want to encourage you that you are called. And I get that, I get that pride and arrogance is a thing. You see, here's the deal. Arrogance is not, is, does not come from you knowing who you are. It does not come from you knowing what you can do. Or it does not come from knowing what you can have. Arrogance comes when you forget who gave it to you. And can I encourage you today? It's okay to know that we are called. It's okay to know that we are the salt of the world. It's okay for you to know that you are redeemed and that you are the head and not the tail. It's okay for you to know. Just keep knowing that it didn't come from you. It came from God himself. The enemy wants you to, to walk in inadequacy, to walk like you don't belong here. And can I encourage you today? You belong here. So uh, a, a few weeks ago, um, actually a few months ago, I, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I had a friend who's a pastor of a church out there. He says, hey, man, I want to just treat your family to this nice restaurant. I said, okay, great. I had my wife with me, and I had my two daughters with me, and I'm excited about this restaurant. Like, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like you need six months reservation type restaurant, the type of restaurant that I would feel so guilty of paying for after I left. I'm like, I could have ate a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich for the same thing. I'm full either way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, I, so we, we make plans to go to this restaurant. My, my friend said, hey, we're going to take care of it. We're going to give you a gift card to go to this restaurant. I, I got you. And so he texts me like the gift card, the digital gift card. And so my family and I, we, we go out there. We, we get ready. We're putting our clothes on. We're taking pictures. I'm even Instagramming, storying, like, hey, hashtag bless, headed to this nice restaurant. So we walk into the restaurant, and you know the restaurant's gonna cost a lot of money when the lights are low. Like, when the lights are low, you should run. Like, they about to charge a whole bunch of money. <laughs> they don't want us to see the bill, that's why the lights are low. <laughs> so we walk into the restaurant, and the lights are low, real dim, we're like, what's happening? And so we come, against this, we come to this lady, this hostess, she has, she has an iPad in her hand, and the glow from the iPad is glowing her face because it's so dark in there. And she said, sir, how may I help you? I said, uh, well, we're here, we're here to eat. She said, you got reservations. I said, uh, I think the guy made reservations for me. Jones, party of four. And so she looks on her iPad and she looks back at us, looks at the iPad, looks back at us, says, sir, I'm sorry. There's no reservation for you. I said, well, we'll wait around. Just give us a, a, a table, Jones, party of four. We need four uh, seats. She said, sir, I'm sorry. There's a six-week waiting list 
to get into this particular restaurant. Unless you're gonna wait for six weeks, you cannot eat here tonight. <laughs> I'm like, well, excuse me, miss? So I don't know what I'm saying to my, my family because I, I didn't know that I had to make reservations. I thought my friend made reservations for me. And so I tell my girls, I'm like, hey guys, I'm sorry. Like, we're going to have to go to Chick-fil-A. Like, I can't, like. So we're walking out. I text my friend who gave us a gift card. Like, man, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to use your gift card, man. I, I didn't make reservations. Then he calls me right away. He says, Pastor, Pastor, stop. The, reserva the reservations, they're not in your name. They're in my name. Go back and tell them Robinson, party of four. So I walk in there, and the lady who had attitude, I said, Robinson, party of four. <laughs> and she was like, okay, sir, follow me. Like, yes, come on, look at me now, come on. <laughs> and I just want to let you know that it, they, your adequacy does not come from you. But because guess what? The reservations is not in our name. Come on, the reservations of your calling and of your future is in a name above all names. Come on, somebody. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. And yes, we have mistakes and yes, we have weaknesses, but our reservations is not in our name. It's in his name, everybody. That's what makes us adequate for the calling of God that's on our lives. And I know that there are some of you, you are walking in an assignment and you are fighting a battle and you feel like you don't belong there. And guess what? By yourself, you don't belong there. But I am so grateful that we are not doing this battle fighting on our own. The Bible says that the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. God is fighting with us and in us and for us. And he will always come to attack your adequacy with inadequacy. I think that there are books that have not been written because of inadequacy. Leadership positions that we have not walked in because of inadequacy. Callings, families are started because of inadequacy. And God will tell you today, Journey Church, it's time for you to walk in full confidence that God has called you here, you belong here, and you are God's chosen people for the calling of God that's resting upon your life today. You're not adequate enough. So, but then, not only did we see the attack on his assignment, on David's assignment, and not only did we see attack on his adequacy, but also what we see here in the text is that God is calling David and the enemy is attacking his uniqueness. And this is the one that I battle with the most and I want to hang out with the longest. Like your uniqueness. So let's read the text. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 38 says this, Then Samuel dressed in David's own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened the sword over the tunic, and he tried walking around. But because he was not used to them, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took the clothes off. He took Saul's armor off. I was thinking about this particular passage in this particular spot in this story. You know, Saul... And though he has many different problems, and though Saul has many different issues, one thing about Saul is that he knew how to fight. He was a warrior. He knew how to fight. In fact, killed thousands of people. And it's really unique, something that, that happens with Saul is that, is that somehow, in some way, God, uses Saul like to, to fight all these battles. And so in that particular time, it made sense for David to use Saul's armor to enter into this fight with this giant. It made sense because Saul did it with his armor. You should take Saul's armor and his sword and go into this fight. But I, it's something interesting that happens in this text is that David says, I know how God did it through Saul. But the way that he did it through Saul won't be the way he's going to do it through me. And I want to encourage with somebody here today that your story feels uniquely 
to you. You feel like you don't fit in. You feel like you, you, you're far behind. You feel like, man, whatever God is doing in your life, it doesn't make sense. You feel like, man, I, I, like God, they got married at 22. I'm 30 years old, I haven't been married. Can I tell you today, your timeline is unique to you. Your story is unique to you. And what the enemy is going to do is attack your unique story, your unique timeline, and, and to say you don't belong. But can I tell you that God is using your uniqueness. God is using your unique timeline. I know they all got married at 25, but guess what? I'm doing something different than you. That's what we see in the text. David said, I, I, I know this is how you're supposed to fight battles. I know this is what everybody else is supposed to, be, supposed to do. I know everyone's supposed to carry the sword and the large helmet and the large uh, uh, armor. And I, I know that's supposed to be the method. But what God's doing in me is different. It's unique. And what God is doing in you is unique. I know some of you, your story doesn't fit in with everybody else's story. It probably doesn't look as clean as everybody else's story. But can I tell you what God's doing in you? It's unique. Your timeline is unique. Like, I wish, by the way, I wish I could preach like your pastor. Did y'all see that brother on Easter? Come on, somebody. On a rock climbing wall. My big butt can't even fit in the little rock climbing wall thing. What I'm doing in there? I can't preach like your pastor, but I can do it the way that God designed me to do it. I can talk the way that God designed me to talk. And I want to tell somebody here today that yes, I know we're living in a social media world where we can see how God did it with everybody else, but can I tell you today, it's going to be unique and different through you. Ain't going to look the same. Ain't going to be the same. We've never seen anyone kill a giant with a slingshot in the text. David, look at Saul, how he did it. Look at Joshua, how they did it. Look at them and how they conquered them. That's how you're supposed to do it. No, no, no. I, I got a slingshot. It's different. It's unique. Timeline's unique. Calling's unique. Your timeline's unique. Your call is unique. Not everybody's going to have that. Not everybody's going to have a divorce like you maybe have. Not everybody's going to have the, the traumatic family that maybe some of you have. It's different. It's unique. Not everybody's going to walk through what you walk through. It's different. It's unique. And can I tell you, that's exactly where God wants you to be. All right, so when I was, when I was young, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. So I was, I was in grade school, third, fourth grade. I couldn't even read where everybody else knew how to read. And it wasn't that I couldn't read. I, I would read really slow. And so I remember the teacher, Miss Smith, would have me at this program called Hooked on Phonics. Y'all remember Hooked on Phonics? Come on, somebody. It was there she realized, she said, Travis, tell me what happens in your mind when you read. I said, well, I actually read backwards in my mind. Then I read forward out loud. And still to the day, that's what I do. Like whenever I read the scripture, I'm actually reading backwards first in my head. And then I process it and read out loud forward. And I always thought that that was gonna be the very thing the very unique disability that keep me from walking in my calling. But you know what's really cool about that disability? Is that I get to the end of the story before you do. Come on, somebody. So I can read knowing that at the end of the story that I'm going to win. I can get to the end of the story and recognize that our God's going to come through for us. My disability has given me the ability to see the end of the story so I can face any giant. I can face any storm. I can face any battle and recognize that what God is doing in me, God will see me through it because we serve an omnipotent God. We serve a faithful God. I've already seen the end of the story 
And I want to let you know that your unique calling, your unique disability, your unique mistakes, your unique past, your unique timeline, your unique family, God is setting you up for something special today. Come on, you stand to your feet today. How about why are you standing? Why are you standing? Here's what happens. Here's what happens. So the Bible says that David takes this slingshot that was so unique that no one ever saw, we've never saw it before. He throws, goes around and he throws this stone and kills this giant of Goliath and many of us know the narrative. But something unique happens. When David killed Goliath with a slingshot, Goliath lays there dead. Then the Bible says that David takes Goliath's own sword and chops his head off. I thought that was really unique and different. But then I realized that David's life is a precursor, a foreshadowing of what Christ is going to do on our behalf. You see, the enemy, Satan, his greatest weapon was death. And the Bible says that not only did Jesus take on death, he used death to cut the head of the snake off so that you and I can walk in our calling today. Can I tell you today, the God that we serve has conquered death on your behalf so that your uniqueness, your assignment, and your adequacy can be fulfilled for you to walk in a calling that God has on your life today. No matter who you are today, no matter what assignment you have right now, you are on schedule. You're on schedule. You are adequate. And you and your timeline is unique. It's not going to look like everybody else. It's going to be different. But trust that God is working on your behalf. Come on, can we give God a hand clap of praise today? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop comparing. Stop comparing. Embrace the journey that it will look a lot different than everybody else's. I'm not sure who's here in the room today. Maybe you didn't really respond. Maybe for some of you need to say yes to God for the first time in a long time. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, man, I need to go all in with Jesus. I've been tiptoeing around this faith thing. I need to go all in with God. And here's the gospel. The gospel is real simple, that we were all sinners in the eyes of God. And so the Bible says that God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. What the Bible teaches us is that God treated Jesus like he was us so that one day he can treat us like we're Jesus. So now we have been called the sons and daughters of God, literally the sons and daughters of God. We now have the same rights that Christ has, all because of his sacrifice on the cross for you and I. If you want to receive that truth and receive the righteousness of God on your life, can I tell you? It's amazing because when you say yes to God, here's what happens. When God looks at you, he don't see your sin and he don't see your past. He only sees the righteousness of God resting on your life today. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for that. Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez. We wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, and don't let the journey stop here. We love for you to do one of three things. Subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all, subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people just like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.